It's a beautiful spring day here in Virginia. I'm up on the Blue Ridge Parkway. It's about 55 degrees up here and the sun is out. And it's just a good day to go out riding. I thought I'd stop here. It's one of my favorite spots to stop and, and introduce the next video, which is going to be about how Jesus works in your life. We're going to look at some Bible verses that tells us exactly how this occurs. And so let's open the Bible and see what it has to say. Our first text in the Bible that we're going to start with today is found in the book of 1 John, chapter 1. And we're going to be reading verses 5 through 9. And this is from the modern King James Version of the Bible. Starting in, in verse 5. And this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this occurs through the blood of Jesus Christ that's applied to our sins today. And not only does God forgive our sins because of the blood of Christ, but he also cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. We're going to look at chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 9 to 18 starting in verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for all. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, to bring many sons into glory, to perfect the captain of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praises to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold me and the children whom God has given me. Since then the children have partaken of flesh and blood. He also himself likewise partook of the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For truly he did not take the nature of angels, but he took hold of the seed of Abraham. Therefore in all things it behooved him to, make, to be made like his brothers, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in pertaining, things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, having been tempted, he is able to rescue those who are being tempted. Now, when you first look at this, it talks about in verse 10, about to perfect the captain of their salvation through sufferings. Now, remember the Bible tells us that Jesus is without sin. And so... What does this mean, perfect the captain of their salvation through sufferings? Well, see, Jesus came to this earth and experienced life as we experience it. And he experienced all the temptations that we are tempted with, and yet he did not fall to them. He overcame sin and was obedient to his Father. And thus, he was perfected for his role to assist us in overcoming sin in our lives. Look at verse 18. For in that he himself has suffered, having been tempted, he is able to rescue those who are being tempted. So that's part of the role of Christ today, is, is to help rescue us who are being tempted by applying his experience to our lives, to give us the power to overcome sin in our lives. Let's go on to the next verse, which is Hebrews 4. And we're going to look at verses 14 through 16. Starting in verse 14. 
Since then we have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Again, this role of Christ as our high priest, who was tempted in all points like we were, yet without sin, is able to help us so we can find mercy and grace in our, to help in our time of need through Christ. All right, the next uh, scripture I want to look at is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to be reading verses 13 through 18. Starting with verse 13. And we are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face, so that the sons of Israel could not steadfastly look into the end of the thing being done away with. But their thoughts were blinded, for until the present the same veil remains on the reading of the old covenant not taken away. But this veil has been done away in Christ. But until this day when Moses is read, the veil is on the heart. But whenever it turns to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. And the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with our face having been unveiled, having behold the glory of the Lord as in a mirror, are being changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Lord's spirit. So what is this telling us? This is telling us, you know, when we study God's word, and we don't understand what it means, Christ can take that veil of not understanding away from our heart to give us wisdom and knowledge. It says in verse 16, But whenever it turns to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. The Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And also talks about our faces having been unveiled, having beheld the glory of the Lord is in a mirror, are being changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Lord's Spirit. So part of the process of the gospel story is to cause change to happen in our lives so that we get rid of the sin and unrighteousness in our life through the power of Christ living in us, that we can be changed even to the same image of, as of Christ by His Spirit. Let's move on to Ephesians. And we're going to look at chapter 2. And let's read verses 13 through 22. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once afar off are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, he making us both one. Talking about both Jew and Gentile. And he has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that he himself may make the two into one new man, making peace between them, so that he might reconcile both to God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity in himself. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him, through Christ, we both have access by one spirit to the Father, by Christ's spirit. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom every building, having been fitly framed together, grows into a holy sanctuary in the Lord, in whom you, you also are built together for a dwelling place of God through the Spirit. So we have access to the Father through the Spirit of Christ. And he, as the cornerstone, he's building a holy sanctuary for God to dwell. And so through Christ, we have access to the Father. Our next uh, text is going to be in Ephesians 4. And we're going to look at verses 7 through 16, starting in verse 7. 
But to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Therefore, he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now that he ascended, what is it but he that also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same also as he who ascends up far above the heavens that he might fill all things. And truly he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And this until we all come into the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a full-grown man, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, so that we no longer may be infants, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, in the dishonesty of men, in cunning craftiness to the wiles of deceit, but that you, speaking the truth in love, may in all things grow up to him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fit together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working of the measure of each part, producing the growth of the body to the edifying of itself in love. So Christ, when he returned to heaven as our high priest, he gave gifts to men. Where are these gifts? Look at verse 11. And truly he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. For what purpose? For the perfecting of the saints, for the working of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. That we can all come into the unity of faith of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a full-grown man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So again, this is part of the work that Christ is doing in our lives today. Let's continue on to Romans chapter 8. And let's look at verses 31 through 39. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Truly he, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? For sh who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect. It is God who justifies. Who is he condemning? It is Christ who has died, but rather also who is raised and who is also at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For as it is written, for your sakes we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep of the slaughter. But in all these things we are more than conqueror through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a beautiful promise. But let's look at verse 34 in particular. It is Christ who has died, but rather who also is raised, and who is also at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Christ is our intercessor. He is making an intercession for us applying the blood of his sacrifice for forgiveness of sins and of our sins and and actually purifying us as we'll see in uh, this next verse in Hebrews 9. Let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 9 and read verses 11 through 15. But when Christ had become a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, nor by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once for all into the holies, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the bl blood of bulls and goats and ashes of a heifer sprinkle the unclean, sanctifies the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause is the mediator of the new covenant, so that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, those who are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So here we see a contrast between the services in the sanctuary of the Old Testament, where the blood of goats and, and calves could purify the flesh, but it's Christ's blood that purges our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. He changes our thought process. He gives us the power to overcome sin in our lives. And that is part of his work as a mediator of the new covenant and part of his work as the high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. We have one more text to look at, and this is John 14. Now, I'm sure many of you have read this text before multiple times, but I don't know how many of you have actually paid attention to the words on the page. Not till a few years ago did I discover what they actually say. We're going to read verses 15 through 27. And it's good to read the whole chapter. In fact, John 14, 15, 16, and 17 will give you a lot of information about the work of Christ in our life today. But we're going to read these verses starting with verse 15. It says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, so that he may be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him, nor know him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. Verse 18. This is Jesus speaking. I will not leave you orphans. Or in the King James says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. You go, wait a minute. I thought this was talking about the spirit of truth. The Holy, the Holy Spirit, another comforter. But if we look in John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, the Spirit of truth is the Spirit of Christ. And in verse 18, he says, I will not leave you orphans, or in the King James, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Let's keep reading to see if we make sure that what we're seeing here is actually the case. Verse 19, Yet in a little while, and the world does not see me anymore, but you see me, because I live, you shall live also. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Who is in us? It's Christ. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will reveal myself to him. Not somebody else. Christ is going to reveal himself to those that keep his commandments. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? You see, the disciples knew he was talking about himself. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If a man loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Remember, no one comes to the Father except by Christ. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. I have spoken these things to you, being present with you. But the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance, whatever I have said to you. Peace I leave, leave with you, my peace I give to you. And as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You know, Jesus throughout his ministry often talked in the, in the sense of a third person. When he talked about the uh, Son of Man, 
he was referring to himself, even though he was speaking in the third person. When he talked about the good shepherd, he, it was, he was referring to himself. And here in John 14, he's using that same tact. He's talking in the third person in John 14, 16. He says, and I will pray to the Father, and he shall give you another comforter so that he may be with you forever. And how do we know who that comforter is? In verse 18, I will not leave you orphans or I will not leave you comfortless, as the King James says, I will come to you. So this is how Christ is working in our lives today. Galatians 4, 6 says, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Do you want Christ in your heart today? Just simply ask him to come into your heart. Ask him to help you with the sins that you're dealing with and struggling with in your life. Claim his blood shed on Calvary to help you not only forgive your sins, cover your sins, but to help you overcome your sins and your life. May God bless you as you continue to study his word.